Welcome. Uh, today's feature is going to be on the Mosin Nagant M9130 battle rifle. As the name would suggest, uh, the Mosin Nagant was uh, initially released in 1891, and it was a result of, the comp of a competition launched by the Imperial uh, Russian military back in the late 1880s in order to uh, replace their service rifle at the time. Uh, there were three competitors. Um, only two of them are actually relevant to the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, one of them was a Russian officer named Mosin, and the other was a Belgian civilian named Nagant. As a result of the competition, Mosin's rifle was the winner, and he was awarded 200,000 rubles, which in 1891 wasn't an inconsiderable sum of money, uh, and his rifle went into production. But before it did, the Russians had noticed that there was a feature on the Gantz rifle that wasn't present on Mosin's rifle, and that was called an interrupter. Without getting too technical, it's essentially a part inside the receiver which prevents double feeding of ammunition. Pretty useful in a battle situation. So the Russians modified Mosin's design added the interrupter and released it as the M1891 rifle. Proving that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Patent battles were even common back in the 1800s. Nagant found out that his interrupter, uh, which he in the meantime patented, was uh, present inside the 1891 rifle, and he made a bit of a fuss about it. Now, in the interests of maintaining peace and also not uh, offending any future um, weapons designers who the Russians may contact for weapons, they paid Nagant off, much like today's IP battles in software. And he got $200,000 uh, rubles as well. So that turned out to be a pretty good move because a few short years later, uh, the Russians went out for a new handgun. And wouldn't you know who won? Nagant and his uh, handgun, the M1895 Nagant revolver, became the official Soviet sidearm, a Russian sidearm, and eventually Soviet sidearm until 1930. Now, as for the M1891, it served Russian soldiers during World War One, the Russian Revolution, the Russo-Japanese War, Fairly successfully, but by about 1930, the Russians had realized that uh, it was beginning to get a little long in the tooth. It was a 39-year-old design by that point, so they decided to modify the rifle somewhat, make some improvements to it, and it became the M1891-30 uh, firearm, which you see in front, or you saw in front of you. Uh, it came in more than one configuration. There were at least four different carbine versions, which is essentially a shorter barrel on a firearm. There was a Dragoon version, there was this full-length version, uh, and they served the Soviet Union all through the Second World War. Uh, as you'll n remember from a previous video I did, the Russians did attempt to replace this with the SVT-40, a semi-automatic firearm, it was too complicated and expensive to manufacture in great quantities, so they essentially stuck out uh, the Second World War with this rifle. So this is essentially the rifle that won the Second World War for the Soviet Union. It fires full power cartridge, uh, 7.62x54R, which just means it's a ribbed cartridge. Uh, the same as the SVT-40. Its lifespan extended to essentially about 1945 when it was replaced by the SKS-45, and as you also remember from a previous video, that rifle only lasted two years before it too was uh, supplanted by the AK-47. So you might be thinking, and if you haven't watched any previous videos, you'll know that where I'm going to be going with this, you might be thinking, that was it for this rifle, but of course that's not the way it works. Uh, the Chinese needed a new rifle for their military, and they adopted, under license from the Russians, the Mosin Nagant, 1891-30. Uh, they designated the Type 53 rifle. 
It only lasted a couple of years with them before they went to the SKS, uh, which was, of course, their Type 56 carbine. Uh, again, as with the SKS video, the Chinese uh, also supplied these to their allies, uh, notably the Viet Cong, uh, Laos, Cambodia, wherever the war was uh, uh, during um, the American involvement in Vietnam, they tended to hand out these rifles as well. In terms of accuracy, it's, it can be a fairly accurate rifle. One of the most famous snipers of World War II, Simo Haya, a Finn, uh, used a modified version of this. Uh, the Finns did use the 1891 in a modified version to kill 550 Russian soldiers in the space of about 100 days. So he was pretty good. Uh, the most famous Russian sniper who also used the Mosin Nagant was Vasily Zatsaev, who you might remember from the Hollywood movie uh, Enemy at the Gates, which starred Jude Law a few years ago. Uh, and there were a number of other uh, famed snipers, uh, men and women, uh, with the Russians who used this in a sniper configuration, which is basically it had a, a scope obviously attached to it. Uh, to this day, this rifle is still in use, uh, which shouldn't surprise you, I suppose. Uh, they're seen in Syria. Uh, they're seen still in number of conflicts in Africa, uh, in the Ukrainian Civil War slash Ukrainian-Russian War, however you want to term that conflict, uh, Mosin Nagants are still being used. Ammunition for it is plentiful, it's a reliable rifle, you know, if you don't have access to anything else, why not? That kind of makes this rifle special in the sense that it was initially introduced in 1891. And it's still being used today. Uh, I know there's a Bulgarian Alpine unit which still uses this rifle as its primary weapon, which makes this the oldest continuous in use rifle uh, in history. Uh, it's now going on about 120 years. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Like I said, it's rugged, it's reliable. If you're lucky, you'll get a very accurate one. If not, you'll just get a minute of man one. Either way, as long as you're hitting someone, it's going to work. And it does, like I said, fire a full power round, which is ballistically equivalent to 308. The hunters out there will know that essentially takes down moose. And this thing is capable of taking down any land animal in North America. Uh, on that show, uh, I believe it's called Life Below Zero, there's an Inuit woman which uses the Mosin Nagant to hunt. So uh, it's still used to this day by hunters and militaries alike. In terms of availability, uh, it's a very available rifle. Um, the Russians alone manufactured 17 million of these during World War II, six years. There were millions before that and they manufactured some after that. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989, a lot of these went out for export and I don't think there are too many Canadian gun enthusiasts who don't own a Mosin Nagant, an SKS, or both of them. I happen to own both. And you can find them in the United States as well. They're also popular down there. Uh, the one that I have was manufactured in 1936 at the, uh, I believe it's Tula factory. I'll have to look up that cartouche later. So this was an interwar rifle. It became, uh, came in between the 1930 update and the 1939 launch of the war with the Germans. So this was more than likely used during the Second World War, whether it was frontline or reservist, you know, we'll never know. Uh, but this is an actual World War II battle rifle. So to me, this is kind of special because it does, who knows what stories it could tell. At any rate, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I won't keep you too much longer. I know that your drive or flight to Northern Ontario was a long one, so I know you would want to be getting back. Happy shooting. Safe shooting. Goodbye.